Crossroads Media. Friends, family, loved ones, welcome on in. If you're new to the channel, hit the subscribe button and hit the thumbs up button as well. I greatly appreciate all of your support. If you want more Broads Media content, you can join the memberships here on YouTube for $4.99 a month and you will get access to Coffee with Broads every Monday and Thursday live streams at 11 a.m. right here on YouTube and you also get the Discord link. All the information is down below in the description. Thank you guys all so much. Enjoy the show. What is going on, everybody? Welcome on into Sports Talk with Broads. No Phillies game today. They have a deserved off day before coming back home after that garbage West Coast swing, if you will. So what I decided to do was do something that we flirt in here once in a blue moon, and that's an Ask Me Anything type of podcast. Ask Broads anything. Phillies, Sixers, Eagles, Flyers, and a smorgasbord of topics will be thrown around. So we will take your anytime hotline calls, your anytime hotline text messages, and where I wanted to start today, the way I look at this text and this question is sort of a layup, or maybe not a layup, but a warm-up, if you will. When you're playing basketball, you go into the layup line, you take some jump shots, you're getting your body going, you're getting the rhythm going, you're trying to get yourself in rhythm with the game so when the ball tips, you're ready to rock. That's how I view the first question that we are going to start off with, and that's why root for the New York Rangers to lose when we have the Florida Panthers pick? So if you are unfamiliar with the situation, not too long ago, the Flyers traded Claude Giroux to the Florida Panthers at the trade deadline and acquired the Panthers' first-round pick and Owen Tippett. So right now, the Flyers, in their grasp, on top of their first-round pick that they own, their own first-round pick, they have the Panthers as well. And the New York fucking Rangers, who I despise, who I hate, and I can't stand their fans at all. They are the worst. They're scumbags. All right, They are pieces of trash. So there's no way in hell I'm ever going to root for them to win one of the most prized possessions in all of sports in the Lord Stanley Cup. The drought we're sitting in, the fact that the orange and black outside of 2010, I can't even remember real competence. And you're going to tell me that a draft pick that might be two picks later is going to be the difference in you rooting for the Rangers or not? That's so silly. All right, there's no way that you can ever convince me that the Flyers should be heavily wanting the Panthers to lose in the Eastern Conference Finals just so they can get maybe instead of the last pick, the second to the last pick. We're not talking an extreme of, hey, the top eight or somewhere in the 20s, in the late 20s or in the 30s. That's not the extreme we're talking here. So it goes on to continue and says, isn't the Flyers' future more important than anything else? And to a degree, yes. But I do think I perfectly just laid it out that there's no way, shape, or form that the difference in a couple of picks that late in the first round will change my opinion on the Rangers. Let's put it to you this way. For you non-hockey people out there. Okay. I'm going to lay out a scenario where the Dallas Cowboys are facing the Carolina Panthers in the NFC Championship game. And you have the Carolina Panthers first round pick. Do you want them to lose? Or do you want them to win? Because I'll tell you for free right now. There's not a fucking ounce of my body that will ever root for the Dallas Cowboys. I'll take a worse pick. The New York Rangers are a big rival. Not for one second would I ever root for the Dallas Cowboys to beat the Panthers so the Eagles have the better pick. The drought for Dallas is significantly more important. The pain and suffering. The fact that their hopes would be so high. 
The Rangers think they can win the cup this year. And quite frankly, they have the goaltending to do it. If they can get anything going from their top two superstars in Zabenejad and Kreider, who's a goal scorer, if they could get anything out of them, then they might actually figure it out. That's why it's so important for the Panthers to squeeze this out because if not, the Rangers will get dangerous if Dallas or Edmonton can't hold the Rangers stars to a nothing burger. That's what Shesterkin is doing for the Rangers right now. They're, they're, uh, he's stealing games for them. They're doing it without top guys performing. That's rare at this time of the year. Here's a stat for you. With Zibanejad and Kreider on the ice at 5-on-5 five five this series, the Rangers have spent more time in the D zone and less time in the O zone with the puck on their sticks than the previous two rounds. The results have shown zero goals and only four scoring chances. That's pretty damn remarkable for the Panthers' view and for it to be tied at the time of this recording, I'm actually in the middle of the first intermission at 0-0 in Game 5 in Madison Square Garden as we sit here right now. I wanted to watch the first before I hit record, so I have it on the left side of me here, and I'll keep an eye if this bleeds into the second period at all. But yeah, I mean, no. No, 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 no. I despise New York after that Knicks run, after them running their mouths, after the Jalen Brunson crap, after their fans storm the, the streets, after every playoff win, first round, second round, thinking that they're winning a championship after every single win with the Knicks, screw off. I value my sanity more than two draft slots. The pressure's on Danny Briere then. Go find somebody. That's the job. Go find someone. That's the way I hold my GM accountable. No excuses. Someone's there. I promise you, someone will be available, whether it's the Panthers winning the Stanley Cup and you have the last pick or if they lose in the Stanley Cup fight, however it breaks down by the end of it. Someone's there. Go get them. And then we'll talk after we see the selection and we see how that person pans out, okay? But that's the way that I approach this. So I'm warmed up now, if you couldn't tell. All right, let's go to the Anytime Hotline, talk a little Sixers here, and let's go to Billy. Yo, bro, it's Billy calling in. Love all the work, appreciate everything you do. Um, just a question on the Sixers. What direction do you want to see them take in free agency? I know Paul George is a name that's been flying around, but looks like he might be staying in L.A. Do you want to trade for Jimmy Butler? I've heard Mikel Bridges thrown out there. Man, would I fucking love that. Um Seen Brandon Ingram in trades. Don't know really if I would like that one. And yeah, I mean, unless you want to go the, the the bench route, not the bench route, but you know the role player route. I mean, that's been a common trend in the NBA. Just give me a thought on what you think. Appreciate it. Thanks, bro. Well, thanks, Billy, for calling in, and that's a great question. And I am so conflicted with this Sixers thing. For a long time now, I was in the mindset of, it's a new era of the NBA. Look at what the Indiana Pacers are doing with just a good amount of structured, solid, legitimate NBA players. But at the end of the day, they get swept by a team that has stars. <laughs> so it only gets you so far. It got them farther than the Sixers ever got with Embiid and Maxi. And that doesn't make me feel very good. And TJ McConnell's out here balling, looking like a star. <laughs> Not really. Just a really good role player, though. And hitting those unbelievable baseline jumpers. Super fun for TJ, no doubt. But there was a cap on what you can do when you don't have superstar talent. Now, I guess the difference is Joel Embiid and Maxi are five times the player anybody on on. 
Indiana is. So if you start with at least Embiid and Maxi, and then from there you build a deep roster with serious role players and serious NBA starters, you have the upper echelon talent already that the Indiana Pacers don't have. So maybe that blueprint will work. And you can convince me, no doubt about it. But if you told me right now, what would I want? What is my preferred way to attack this offseason? There's one that is a no-brainer. This is what you go all in trying to do. You make every phone call. You make Joel Embiid make phone calls. I don't care if it's not even allowed. I don't care if it goes against what the NBA lets you do. Everybody sneaks around at this time of the year to try and team up with others. What are you thinking? What are you doing? It's how it goes. Go get LeBron James. If you want a real chance to do this based off of what's available, and when I say that, I'm talking whether it's a trade or whether it's free agency, go get LeBron James. That's what gives you the best chance to do it. Joel LeBron Maxi. Let's go take a swing at this. And guess what? If that costs me a first-round pick because I have to go draft Bronny James, you do it. Now, you don't do it just to take a flyer. You do it if you know it's set in stone. Hey, LeBron, we will get this done. We will get your ass to Philadelphia. We'll draft your kid. I'm only doing that if it's about a 92% chance or more that he's coming. If it's 40%, No, I'm not just wasting that first pick on LeBron. I'm telling you, if it is a vocal agreement, you take Bronny, we'll make this thing work, then absolutely, no doubt about it, a thousand percent, yes, 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 yes. That's the best shot at it. Do I want to give up assets for Jimmy Butler at his age, 35, broken down, max contract? Do I want to do that? No. Do I want to go after Paul George? No. I don't feel good about any of this, except LeBron. That's the only one that screams, hey, there's real promise here. The others, it seems more desperation than anything else. Here's where I find myself in a sticky spot, though. And trust me, I understand that this is hard to follow because there's a lot of different things to kind of consider throughout this hypothetical of what Daryl Morey is going to do this offseason. One of the big things that I stand on firmly is I will go down swinging with Joel Embiid until Joel Embiid barges into the GM's office and screams, get me the hell out of this city. Until that happens, and I don't know if it ever will, I'm not giving up on Embiid. And if that's the case, if you're trying to squeeze all the juice out of the lemon, it's not preferred to go get Jimmy. But because this is the current landscape of the free agency market, the year Tobias Harris comes off the books, I don't want to do it. But once again, you're trying to squeeze all the juice out of the Joel Embiid lemon. If that's the case, do you swallow your pride and go, all right, we got to try this Jimmy Butler thing. Maybe it doesn't work. But we have to try everything. Or do you go the route of OG? Do you go the route of maybe making trades with the Pelicans, looking for Ingram, looking for Levine? No, I I don't love those. I don't love those. I really don't. You could talk me more into OG than Levine and, and Ingram, but they broke me. They have beaten me down heavily. I didn't want to go the Paul George route, and I don't. But I know that that sounds a little playing both sides of the fence because if you're going to try everything in your power with Embiid and get the best players for him, does Paul George make more sense than building a team like Indiana had? 
And Indiana ended up not even having a chance to compete against the Boston Celtics when it was all said and done. They didn't have a chance. They got their asses swept. The Sixers were taking Boston to seven games last year. And realistically, in game six at home, had wide open looks to close things out. And they were just bricking left and right. The Sixers actually compete with Boston more. Come up just shy. But they give you way better effort than what the Pacers did over the last few years. Go get LeBron James. Go get LeBron James. That's what I need Daryl Morey to do. Let's take another call, and we'll move forward. You are incorrect about Tyrese Halliburton, and you will regret it, what you have said about him. And that's okay to be wrong. It's totally okay. But best of luck to you and the 76ers. It's time to blow up the team and get rid of Joel. What, what was I wrong when it comes to Tyrese Halliburton? Let me know where I was wrong. Now, when I say he stinks, he's not what everybody thinks he is, in a way, that's a metaphor. I don't even know if that's the right grammar that I'm talking about here. I don't know if that's the right word. But it's not that he actually is the worst NBA player ever. He doesn't stink like Furkan Korkmaz stinks. He stinks in regards to people are blowing it way out of proportion because what you need to realize is the Sixers have to win now. They don't have time to play the whole, let's see what Halliburton can blossom into. He's only 20-something years old. That's the issue right now between Maxi and Embiid is their timelines don't match, but you're trying your very best to make this work because you are desperate due to Embiid's timeline. So if you go back in time to Daryl Morey trading Ben Simmons to Harden, if the opportunity to go after it right then and there with the seasoned vet, with the polished pro, with one of the best passers in NBA history facilitating the Rock, and you could team that up with Embiid and have the league leader in assists tied together with the league scorer, league leading scorer in Joel Embiid, you have to take that to almost try to maximize the roster knowing there's flaws in how early Maxi is in his career, if that makes sense. So I will acknowledge this when it comes to my frustration with the Halliburton trade and the way that Sixers fans have reacted to it over the past year or so. I do think I'm letting the loud, loud minority influence my view of Halliburton. All right, I self-assessed, I looked at it, and there's no doubt that the portion of people that scream at Maury is not the same that view it with more of a logical sense of, hey, maybe we should have valued what Halliburton was more. And if you say it in that tone, maybe we can sit down and talk in a normal way, right? But I do get angry because you can't, in the moment, have any information on how it's going to play out. And if you're Daryl Morey, and you have to trade a guy who's unwilling to show up. When he does, he's an issue. He's a locker room problem. He's faking mental health. He's trying to get paid through the CBA. He shows up to practice, says he's going to speak to the media, dips out instead, gets kicked out of practice, and Doc Rivers sends his ass home. When you're dealing with that, and you can bring in a James Harden, Forget the he stat. He doesn't. See, that's what I'm saying. That's what gets me angry. I understand that he hasn't won a championship. I've defended the Houston Rockets at the time. Daryl Morey. All right, this is one thing I'll say about this. And I, I'm telling you, this one gets the blood flowing more than most. He doesn't stink as a general manager or president of basketball ops just because he hasn't won a championship. That doesn't mean you can't put together championship caliber teams. It also doesn't mean me defending him uh, claims that he has never made mistakes or he's perfect. He's not perfect. He does make calculated risks. Sometimes they work. Sometimes they benefit the organization. Sometimes they don't. But I will say that Houston team that lost to one of the most historic Golden State squads in NBA history, 
Just because they went to Game 7 and failed doesn't mean that he was a problem and he was stupid for building that team and that team is incapable of winning a championship. I thought the 2022 Philadelphia Eagles were built to win a championship. They didn't because Pat Mahomes, Andy Reid in the Super Bowl stole it from us after having a double-digit halftime lead. But the roster Howie Roseman built was good enough to do it. They didn't doesn't mean it wasn't good enough to do it. That's how I look at those Houston teams, and you could say, well, that was years ago, and I'm aware of that. But what you can't do is pretend as if when he came here, he didn't have to deal with an Al Horford contract that everybody and their mother said not a soul in the NBA would ever touch. He got rid of that. He traded Josh Richardson and got him out of here as well. You bring in Seth Curry, you get Andre Drummond, you're trying new things. You have a max contract player that he inherited, giving you zero points, zero points in a closeout game while Embiid is essentially giving you 40 and Maxi's doing everything in his power to try and uh, help out as well. I mean, there's just only so much you can do when you are handed the slop that Maury was handed and finally the year that he has the full throttle to go do something sexy, the free agency market blows. So I do think that one issue with Maury that bothers me right now is in Instead of building a team, he's just trying to grab a bunch of guys. But at the end of the day, when you look at Kyrie and Luka, when you look at J- Jason Tatum, Jalen Brown, I, I mean, that's, that's what wins. That's what wins. So I don't despise the mentality totally, but I don't want to pay someone who has a big name, a star-level name, who doesn't produce at a star level, a max contract because that's what we just got out of with Tobias. Now, Paul George is way better than Tobias Harris is. Tobias isn't even close to a star name. Paul George at least does have a star name to it. But, I mean, Howie Roseman, you would all deem, is one of the greatest general managers in football. He has one Super Bowl, and it took him until 2017, and he's been a GM for quite some time to do it. So I just, I don't think that he's nearly as atrocious as everybody makes him out to be just because he doesn't have the hardware. There's a lot of variables to it when you break it all down. What he had to deal with when he got here, when he was with Houston, what happened, and it's not excuse making. It's not. Because Joel Embiid, part of the reason why Joel Embiid hasn't had maybe the success that I would want at this particular time, he had to play with a guy who didn't shoot that fucked up the spacing and now you're playing four on five. You had to deal with Tobias Harris who at times got lost hanging out by the perimeter and became a non-factor as a max contract player. Every time he goes to the bench, the team is minus 8,000. When he's on the floor, the team is plus 8,000. These are real issues, systemic Sixers issues that are a part of the roster building dating back to when this whole entire thing started. And I don't want to relive every single detail of the process and all that stuff, but it is reality. It is truth to it. So that's sort of my thought on all of that with the Halliburton and the Embiid. We're not trading Embiid, by the way. That's the silliest thing I've ever seen or heard in my entire life. All right, let's take our next call. And this one will be on the fighting fills. Hey, it's Mike Vance. I just got a real quick question for you. I think it's a good discussion point. At this minute, at this moment in time, how many legitimate all-stars are on this one Philadelphia Phillies roster? The way they're playing, the way they're putting teams to bed, the way they're coming back, the ERAs of the pitchers, the the RBI totals, the hit totals, the the, the batting averages, how many legit all-stars are coming off this one roster. Thank you. Well, thank you for calling in with that question. All right, so what I'm not going to do is break down where every single team in the National League is and where their third basemans are compared to Alec Boehm, where their first basemans are compared to Bryce Harper, where their outfield is, although the Phillies outfield seriously needs some work to be done. And I'll be honest with you, Joe Giglio let the Phillies Twitter world on fire a couple days ago mentioning Trey Turner out in the outfield because Sosa has a way better glove and the way that he's been swinging the bat 
although they plugged him into that two hole the other day and he had a fat offer. So obviously if you put these role players in everyday roles, it doesn't have the same impact and I'm aware of that. But it's really not a knock on Trey Turner even though his defense is very below average. It's more about the fact that your your outfield is just not sensational right now in any way, shape, or form as a unit. So maybe you can try and bolster that. But anyway, I just want to put a little... Uh, a notification out there, if you will, that I'm not doing the research on other teams and where they're certain, uh, just strictly from the Phillies' perspective. I mean, obviously, Alec Boehm, I thought he's been the MVP of the Phillies to this point as a whole. He has 22 doubles. He's hitting 308, and by the way, he has 47 runs batted in, which is pretty remarkable considering his power numbers only hitting five home runs or so. It's not as if he's raking and hitting a billion bombs, and that's how he's knocking in the these runs. So I think the way that he's doing it is pretty ridiculous in a good way that is. And I think Alec Bohm absolutely deserves to be an all-star. All of these men that I'm about to reference are all not going to be all-stars, by the way. But you can make serious, serious uh, arguments made for, for these guys do that. Now, it sucks for Trey because he was hitting over 340 before he got injured, but now that he's missing so much time, he obviously is not going to get the nod. But Bryce Harper, 13 home runs with almost a 900 OPS. And by the way, his name is Bryce Harper. So when people go to the ballpark, they travel to the All-Star Weekend. The home run derby is always exciting. Everyone goes and it's this cool atmosphere Bryce Harper, it, 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 it matters. And, and I know we can actually look back at maybe some of the years that he's been here and not an all-star, but MVPs. It's pretty ridiculous to think that. But, um, you know, just kind of giving you what Bryce Harper has done to this point, we'll see what happens. The pitching is where it really puts the eyeballs open and wide open where you're stunned to see some of these numbers. Wheeler has a 2.32 ERA. Ranger has a 1.75 ERA. Nola has a 3.04 ERA. Ranger Suarez has a, what is this? This is a 2.83 ERA. Sorry, I can't read my handwriting here, but Ranger Suarez and his ERA is sub three. Those are your top four guys. It, oh, sorry, that's Suarez. Christopher Sanchez. <laughs> I apologize. I'm sorry. We have so many lethal weapons and so much talent on this rotation. The sub three RA is Christopher Sanchez. I knew that didn't really register the way that it needed to. Christopher Sanchez even has been balling out so much that you can make the case for him on top of some of your relievers. Matt Strom. 8 one ERA. He only allowed two earned runs so far this year in 22 and a third innings. Hoffman, in 23 and two third innings, has allowed three runs total. A 1.14 ERA. I, you could go along the list here. JT Romuto, the best catcher in baseball. The one that's going to hurt me a ton, though, is, unfortunately, and I don't want to admit this, but Kyle Schwarber, mm. Mm -mm -mm. Kyle Schwarber not being a part of this thing hurts my soul. It hurts my soul. One of the greatest to ever do it. The best leadoff hitter of all time ever in the history of life. I think he should get on the all-star team just because of that. And when the graphic pops up, when it's on the broadcast and Kyle Schwarber leads off in the All-Star game and it gives you numbers, it has that little note that is outside of just his batting average, his OPS, his home runs. It has that little note underneath. And I wanted to say, the greatest leadoff hitter of all time ever in the history of mankind ever on planet Earth, the greatest home run hitter ever, he's better than Barry Bonds. I want that to fit all the way across the bottom of the screen. I'm just saying, all right, don't get mad at me. It's just factual information. Let's go back to the phones. Hey, so I just wanted to discuss quickly about the Philadelphia Eagles. Um, Schedule-wise, I feel like the, the Eagles on paper and with the schedule should win the East. I'm looking at the Eagles' schedule, and I do see that they have the AFC North, so that would be definitely a problem. Um, but they don't – I've – I've never seen Dallas' schedule as hard as it is with Houston, San Francisco, and Detroit. So 
with this in mind, I am very, very adamant that the, the Eagles need to win the East because schedule-wise, Dallas' schedule is one of the hardest I've ever seen for them. One of the hardest ever seen? I don't know. We'll take a look at it. That's a pretty big statement to make here. And the the Eagles had to go through a crazy gauntlet. I'll say this, though. I haven't looked at the Dallas Cowboys schedule because I'm focused on the Eagles and what they do. And if they take care of business, if their offensive coordinator makes sense because it did it last year, if Nick Sirianni can get the hell out of the way, if Vic Fangio can be strong, if these players can step up and really improve from who they were last year, Jordan Davis, N'Kobe Dean, some of the guys who have already been here, Josh Sweat, Jalen Carter without hitting any sort of wall and going unseen at the end of the year. If guys can really develop Quinion Mitchell, Cooper DeGene, if they can make plays as rookies, then I, I mean, I demand them no matter what the Dallas Cowboys schedule is to win the NFC East. But we will pull up the actual Dallas Cowboys schedule because I haven't looked at it at all. Quite frankly, I haven't really thought about it. But they do start the season playing the Cleveland Browns in Cleveland. They play the New Orleans Saints. They play Baltimore, both of them in Dallas. There is actually a little bit of a rough spot here. I don't know how good the Pittsburgh Steelers are going to be, but this would be one, two, three, four. Week five for the Cowboys. It's a Sunday night game at Pittsburgh. Mike Tomlin, you're on the road. Don't know what they are. But it, it's, it's never easy going up against a very professional head coach like that. Maybe I'm wrong. Look, maybe a team ends up stinking and winning four games, although that guy never falls below 500. So he's winning nine games somewhere. Somewhere along the way, that dude's winning nine games somehow. Maybe one of those happened to be against the Dallas Cowboys. But this is a pretty rough stretch for them. Week five, you're going to Pittsburgh. Week six, you're playing at home, but you're playing the Detroit Lions. Keep in mind, they do have good record at home, though, so if they're playing a tough opponent in front of their own fans, there might be something to it being where they feel more comfortable. They have a bye week, week seven. Week eight, they're playing at San Francisco. Week nine, they're playing at... Atlanta. Week 10, they're home against the Eagles. Week 11, they're on the, uh, they're home against Houston. So look, two of those teams that you bring up, the Detroit Lions, the Houston Texans, they're tough opponents, but both of them are in their own facility. That needs to matter as well. And they play the Cincinnati Bengals. And that game is also in Jerry's world. So for whatever it's worth, the tough opponents they play are at home. Doesn't mean they win them all. But I think that's a rough one for them. Weeks 5 through 11. Pittsburgh, Detroit, San Fran, Atlanta, Eagles, Houston. Yeah, that's, that's, a, that's a little bit of a rough stretch for sure. They find ways to win regular season games though. For whatever it's worth. That doesn't make me feel good. Doesn't mean that I think they could ever actually do something in the postseason because you know they're going to fall flat on their face. And this is one thing I don't want to agree with. And we all love Ray Dittinger to death. Love Ray Dittinger to death. I heard him on the radio today, and something he brought up is the Texas Rangers do just won a World Series, right? So as of today, they are a defending World Series champions. Right now, the Dallas Stars are in the Western Conference Finals, and the Dallas Mavericks are in the Western Conference Finals with a good lead against the Minnesota Timberwolves. And he's pulling for all of them to win because it would make Dallas fans feel so much pain and suffering knowing the only team that can't win is the Dallas Cowboys. And while from a general sense that makes sense, let's sit back for one second and really digest that from an Eagles fan level. Let's pretend the Eagles could never win a championship. Won't happen under Jeffrey Lurie and Howie Roseman because we have competent people in place who have a real desire and knows how to push certain buttons. But let's say we happen to be a team that goes through a 45-year drought of incompetent football. Sixers are winning a title. Flyers are winning a title. Phillies are winning a title. That makes it easier for me, not harder. Of course, I'm hungry for the Eagles to do it. 
I would want the Eagles to get over the hump and finally finish the door. Sort of like when a tennis player is waiting to win. They won Wimbledon. They won U.S. Open. They win all these tournaments. And they need one more to finish off the Grand Slam. Of course, we would want to finish off the Grand Slam with the Eagles. But you're telling me the Sixers winning, Joel Embiid winning a championship would it help? Would it help that pain? Yeah, it would help the pain. So Ray's not the old, we love Ray, by the way. All right, we love Ray. Ray Diddy's the GOAT. So it's not just Ray Diddinger. I've heard that a lot, actually, but he's the one that sort of brought it to light on the airwaves that I heard for the first time. I'm sure there are other people bringing it up. But yeah, I just, I, I can't ride with that one. That's all. I just can't ride with that one. All right, let's take a, let's see here. Looking through, looking through. Do, 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 do. We had a Flyers one in here. Oh, here it is. So it's uh, one in the morning right now. I just finished editing your stuff. And, you know, something, you know, I see your ask anything for broke, so I, why not Amadeo throw his uh, two cents into this thing? Uh, I want to get your thoughts on the whole rumors, obviously, because i got to bring up Flyers, the whole rumors on the Travis Konechny contract extension talks. Because, yeah, the rumor is, you know, his agent wants him to get 10 plus million. Obviously, that's a negotiation tactic. He's not going to get paid $10 million a season. But I'm still a little skeptical about signing Travis Konechny long term. This is not a knock on TK the player. I think he's a good player. I just don't think where this franchise is right now, you should not be locking up guys that are almost 30 years old in their late 20s that by the time this team is ready to compete he's going to be in his early to mid 30s I just don't see it and I'm not comfortable paying Travis connect me almost eight and a half million I understand the caps going up and all that stuff but I just don't think that you pay a guy that hasn't really eclipsed point per game and has barely produced 30 goal seasons he's only done it twice in his career I don't think you should be paying him that much money. Owen Tippett almost came close to what Konechny's totals were this year, and now he's being paid less than Konechny on what his expected extension is going to be. I think the priority should be trying to lock up some of your long, your younger players, like a Forrester and a Ken York. I think that should be the priority of a rebuilding team. But I'm not saying I wouldn't extend Konechny. I'm very skeptical about extending him long term. That's okay. I agree with you. I agree with you. I don't know if I feel comfortable with it either because he's a good player. He is a good player. But if you're going to pay him top money, and I know the cap's going up, as you alluded to. 10 is ridiculous. If they fall in that 8 range, then okay, I think that's probably where the market says he is. So him and his agent is going to fight for that. Another 8-year contract, though, signing these guys to these super crazy long-term deals. All I'm saying is this. If they do sign TK, and it does seem apparent that they really want him here and to keep him here, his personality, his leadership, he has matured as a player. He's matured as a leader, too, and really trying to change the culture here. I do believe that there are a lot of tendencies that he brings that I like, so I'm not against it, but I would need a lot more, like a, like a lot more. I, I need him to develop a ton, like a ton. I need a whole nother step into his game. Seriously, I need him to take over to a different extreme. Not just be a 30-goal scorer and a, a nice, a, a, a nice, and I know 30 goals is nothing to sneeze at. 30 goals is, is solid, but there's a there's a feeling around 30 goals. You could find two different 30-goal scorers and one have a different impact than the other. Other teams have to be aware of when TK's on the ice. Absolutely. But there's other 30-goal scorers that it, it just hits different. It elevates different. And I need TK. He's a star. I mentioned he's a star all year long for sure. But if you're going to get paid that bag, I, I need him to take even a bigger monster step. And at 27, you know, he, he's not 24, 25 anymore. When he's 27, 28, 29, you might kind of be what you are. And a 30-goal scorer is not anything to see. That's a, it's a good player to have on your roster. The only thing I'll disagree with you on is, you know, you say now is not the time because someone like TK might be mid-30s, early 30s when the team gets good. He's 26, 27 right now, let's say. I mean, this team better be good when he's 29. 
<laughs> you know, I I'm not worried about him being, even if he's 30, 31, you should still have enough left in the tank to be worthy at 30, 31 years old. Like this rebuild, they're already into this rebuild. Mitch Goff should be here. Cam York has taken big time strides. Sandheim is making that contract look nowhere as brutal as it once was. I don't know where you are with Couturier. Owen oh, Tippett, Forster. I'm even intrigued by Morgan Frost this year. So I'm just saying that by the time they turn this thing around, if he's mid-30s or a little bit past the early 30s, if he's 33, that's a disaster. That's six years. Six years. This rebuild better be done by six years. I'm just saying. You know? So I think... Maybe our thoughts on the timelines are different. And Amadeo, I love you to death. You know that Amadeo works his ass off for us here. One of the things that we fought about in previous text message exchange was the fact that I demand them to make the playoffs next year because of how close they were this year with the collapse and he has more wiggle room with the rebuild and I'm like no dude like this thing is moving in the trajectory of upwards there's no steps back this thing needs to keep going on the tracks and going uphill this better be in where it needs to be when Connect needs 29 and 30 at the max. That's three more years. Three more years. If they're not turning this thing around where they have real sus sustainability in three years, I'm going to be pissed. So I do agree with you of having fear, though, with TK because I can see a world where he gets paid a lot of money and he's just a good player. But you got to be more than a good player. And he's better than good. He is better than good. I just, I need more. And I think that's why we are all uncomfortable as a fan base. I don't hear many Flyers fans saying, Unless I'm not reading the posts, I haven't been as engaged with Flyers Twitter as some normally are, but I don't hear the, oh yeah, you do it in a heartbeat, no doubt. A lot of the people I've been speaking to have their speculation on it and have their confusion on it on what's the right price tag because he's he's given us a lot and he's given us a ton of goal scoring ability. But once you get that bag, there's a different level of expectation and a different jump that we need from him. And he has to make that. Can he? Sure. Do I think this is probably who he is last year? If he gives you that for a bunch of years, and that's not a bad player to have on your roster. It's, is it worth the cap hit? Even with the cap going up. It's tough. It's tough. All right, everybody. Hope that makes sense. We're going to wrap things up here. Really enjoyed the Ask Broads Anything pod. It's fun. It's a little different. It's all sorts of random topics, and you just kind of ramble. So can't thank you all enough for everyone who, who left their calls and asked a question. You guys are the greatest. Love you guys to death. I'll catch you all on the next one.